Hello and welcome to the Korean Beauty Show podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Lee, K-beauty expert, founder of Style Story, where you can shop, learn and explore the world of Korean skincare and your guide for everything you need to know about what's going on in the world of Korean beauty. So today is, of course, our news and update special that we do every fortnight. And I did just want to update you guys on, uh, it's not really housekeeping, I guess, but just a decision that I've made. So before the summer, I mentioned that I was going to drop uh, the podcast down back down to one day a week, just because over the summer I had a lot going on uh, and I just didn't want to have to compromise I guess the quality of the show it just takes so much time to prepare these episodes for you to get everything ready and you know over the summer I had a lot going on so I made that decision and what I've noticed after having done that is that we actually have far more listeners we've got more people tuning in than ever before and I think that a lot of that probably has to do with the quality being a little bit better when I was putting out two episodes a week I I was feeling a lot of pressure, very rushed. You guys know I don't get paid to do this. It's actually uh, the business pays all of the editing fees and all of that. So it's a big time commitment. It's a money commitment as well. Uh, And I was just feeling really pressured to get out two episodes a week. So I think what I'm going to do, having seen the stats and seeing that we are actually getting more listeners doing fewer episodes, I'm just going to keep doing the one a week. Uh, I really want to have the time that I need to properly research everything and bring you a higher quality of show. Uh, And I'm just, you know, a one woman band really doing this. Obviously, I don't edit the podcast myself. That is the work of my lovely editor, Brianna, and her team. But, you know, in terms of putting it all together, getting all the information and all of that, it's just a lot of work that is taking time out of my schedule. There is a lot going on in the businesses at the moment. Uh, There's a lot going on for me personally as well. Uh, And I just know that I am not going to have the time at the moment and probably for the foreseeable future to put out two really good high quality episodes a week. So that is just a decision that I have made. I hope you guys can understand that. Uh, And look, if you did really enjoy the two episodes a week, I'm hoping that you will appreciate an improvement in quality and just some better variety of content as well that I will be able to provide and put out for you if I have just a little bit more time to put it all together. There is a really great Korean phrase for times like this and it's chongshin yopso. It's basically like you're out of your senses (laughs) and I felt like that when I was putting the show together. I was just like ah chongshin yopso. Like I don't have the time to do it the way that I would really like to do it. If we were a much bigger team you know then sure but podcasting is just one small part of the business but it is unfortunately a very big time suck uh so that is just a choice that i have had to make we are not like a professional podcasting organization or corporation or anything like that we don't get any ad revenue from doing this Uh, it's literally just me putting this content out into the world and while i really do love doing that uh, i do just have to prioritize other things in my life as well so that everything gets done Uh, at the end of the day i'm the boss the buck stops with me and if people from my team can't get hold of me and i can't devote you know time to other things that need to happen to keep the business running then that is not me doing my job so and Anyway, look, that is a little bit of a tangent, but I just thought that I probably should share that with you because there will be probably some people that remember that I said that, oh, let's just drop it back down to one day a week over the summer. And summer is over. It is now uh, moving into autumn here, which is my favorite time of the year. Uh, Spring in Australia for all the Aussie listeners. But yeah, that is just what needs to happen at this moment in time. (laughs) If anything changes, um, you know, obviously I will let you guys know. But for now, like I'm not stepping away from it altogether, but I just need to take that pressure off myself 
um, and have a little bit more time to put everything together for you guys because I really just was not feeling comfortable about how rushed it was all getting. Like even putting together the show notes, that actually takes me at least half a day, not to mention researching the episodes and whatnot. Like I'm often up until late at night doing it. So it just, this is the way that it needs to be for now. So thank you everyone for your understanding and I'm hoping that you will enjoy the episodes that are going to be put out in the future and that yeah they will be more useful to you than just some slapdash last minute effort without any further ado let us jump into the k-beauty news headlines so one of the things that i thought that you might be interested to hear a little bit more about i actually recently spoke with cosmetics design asia uh, and they have a really amazing platform it's a news site they don't just cover asia they cover europe australia north america uh, with a lot of market analyses, types of articles, uh, you know, everything from new launches to new innovations, new research that is being done, any sort of studies and things like that in the beauty industry. And their journalists often reach out to me wanting, you know, a little bit more information about a particular trend or something like that. And for this particular article, what they were actually wanting to do is talk to people specifically who are maybe interested in launching their own beauty brand or products into the Korean market. So often you'll hear people talking about outbound stuff that's going on, which is Korean companies in Korea looking to export overseas. But this is kind of going the other way. So they were just trying to get a better understanding of, you know, some of the, the, um, I guess, key touch points in the industry, Korean beauty consumers and all of that. So I thought, look, some of this might be interesting to our listeners as well. Now, I know a lot of this stuff we will have covered probably generally over the course of the show, but But this was kind of my take on the need to know about a brand from a brand's perspective before launching into the Korean market. So Korean beauty consumers, in terms of a marketer's perspective, they usually group them by generations. So the MZ or MZ generation, you'll hear this talked about all the time, and that is millennials and Gen Z. So they're kind of the older one, the, the younger ones rather, and they are the ones that I think are the most trend focused and quite discerning too when it comes to things like ingredients and what's in the products. They are the ones that are really keen on the vegan packaging at the moment. I think they're probably also the ones that are most influenced by what's going on with their favorite celebrities. So the idols, um, you know, K-pop groups, K-drama stars, all of that. It's not uncommon for a particular beauty item to sell out uh, after it's been featured in like a local drama or by a local celebrity, not just Korean products, of course, um, you know, foreign products as well. If one of the stars is wearing like a certain shade of lip gloss or lipstick or something like that, you'll often see that that sells out afterwards. And that's most times because of these millennial and Gen Zs. In terms of the older generation, they have slightly uh, different preferences, different concerns, and they consume media in a different way to the younger generations, as is probably the case all over the world. So in terms of the ideal strategies or ways to break into the Korean market, this was something that they were curious about. And I thought this was such an interesting question because It's not a question that I'm obviously asked very often, like how should a brand go about breaking into the Korean market? I have had brands reach out to me from time to time, uh, Australian brands, for example, that are wanting to launch into Korea and just sort of ask some questions. And it is a really tough market to crack for foreigners, not just in the beauty industry, but in all industries. I can give you so many examples of really popular, really well-known foreign concepts, foreign businesses that have failed spectacularly in Korea. Uh, And that's because Koreans do have, in a lot of ways, uh, a very protectionist culture that 
preferences the Korean over the foreign. Uh, and so what I mean by that is, you know, things like eBay, you won't see that here. There are Korean versions of that. The same thing with Uber. Uber spe- failed spectacularly, but we have something similar, which is Kakao Tea, Kakao Taxi. And it works basically the same way as Uber, but Uber itself for a whole lot of different reasons failed in Korea. And um, beauty is not exactly the same. Obviously, there are lots of different uh, foreign beauty brands that are really succeeding in Korea. But what I will say is that in general, they tend to be brands that are already famous overseas that have a, a cult or hero product. And it's usually the kind of products that Koreans would seek out when they are shopping overseas anyway. They are the kind of products and brands that tend to do well over here. So, you know, for example, Benefit um, Cosmetics has like a standalone store inside a lot of malls or like a kiosk, um, Clarins, all Clinique, all of those kind of ones tend to do well here. Um, Avene, La Roche-Posay, I'm trying to think who else. A lot of the French ones do quite well here. Uh, and, you know, they're global companies. They are big companies anyway. They would do well in other markets. So it just makes sense that they're here in Korea. Uh, in terms of like breaking into the market itself, Uh, You would really need to uh, identify your target customer and then kind of drill down into where they're hanging out Uh, because the younger generation is so trend focused. This is the hard thing, I think, for a lot of companies is that they just cannot keep up with a constant cycle of newness that a lot of younger people demand. Uh, You know, what I have seen that has been quite successful, particularly in Seoul, is pop-ups by foreign beauty brands. So what they normally do is they normally pick a hot which is a Korean shorthand for hot place, a hot place. So they usually do like a marketing campaign that way and they'll do like a pop-up and you can go in and, you know, t- t- test some of the products, try them out. Uh, collaborations are another really big one. I see local brands doing this really well and uh, foreign brands as well. So teaming up with like, for example, a really popular uh, roastery in Seoul, like a, a, a cafe that produces their own beans for their coffee shop and then they'll do a collaboration that way you know a lot of korean brands also do collaborations with disney with um you know hello kitty and all of these kind of popular things and tie it in there Product placement in dramas is another popular local marketing strategy, uh, and a lot of companies have used this very successfully. Obviously, you need to have a lot of money to be able to do this, but for bigger foreign brands, I think it's possible. For the older generations, home shopping is still very popular, and that can be a good place to concentrate on for marketing activities just because, you know, I, I think home shopping has a different image maybe, or people perceive it differently in lots of different countries. Uh, you know, some people see it as a little bit junky, like, you know, they're trying to sell you stuff you don't need. Like, you know, I remember when I was little uh, and I was like watching the daytime soaps and things like that if I was ever home from school. And they were trying to sell you like a fat blaster or things like that. But home shopping in Korea sells a whole range of different things. And I have had, um, you know, elderly Koreans tell me over the years that they buy everything from like abalone and, you know, Korean beef and things like that through home shopping all the way through to cosmetics. So that is a very popular place for the older generation to at least get ideas on, you know, what to buy if they're not shopping directly. But a lot of brands have made their fortunes and made names for themselves through home shopping. So that's one not to discount if people were to enter the local market. Um, You know, in terms of what are the trends, it's very important to keep up with the trends. You will have picked this up just from listening to the show. At the moment, the key ones are vegan beauty, sustainability. We've got probiotic skincare, the microbiome stuff, clean beauty, uh, a focus on ingredients that calm and soothe the skin. In terms of makeup, cushion foundations and BB creams, very popular, lip tints, eyeshadows in the neutral and pink. Each tones. So these change constantly, 
and frequently. So clean beauty has been going on for a few years, as has vegan beauty, and sustainability sustainability rather just continues to grow. But it is in general very important to be at least aware of what is going on trend-wise in Korea if you were, you know, thinking to launch here. Any brand that is, you know, wanting to succeed really needs to be on on top of this. In terms of future trends that I think are a fairly safe bet. If you were a new beauty company or you were wanting to launch in Korea, clean beauty is going to continue to be popular. Edible beauty as well uh, is definitely on the rise. Things like probiotics and collagen. The difficulty is that the local brands are already doing really well with these trends. So it would be harder for a foreign brand to launch, uh, you know, without some really extra special selling point. The fact that you have a collagen powder is probably not going to cut it. But if it is like, you know, a really globally famous trend, trending product on TikTok or something like that, that might get you over the line. Sun sticks are another one that are currently emerging as a new trend. Uh, how long this lasts, I'm not sure. The, the wisdom, see, the scientific wisdom on these sun sticks at the moment seems to be that basically they are kind of useless in the sense that you need to apply so many layers of them to get the stated level of protection that, you know, it's not really worth it, certainly not as your primary method method of application, but the companies marketing them are marketing the hell out of them. So, you know, sometimes those kind of facts get lost in the detail of the marketing. So that could be one that keeps growing in popularity. Um, So they were just some of the things. It was a much, much longer than that. Um, I will put a link to the article and not all of these things made it into the article. They they interviewed a range of different people uh, to get their take on, you know, what's trending in the market, challenges, limitations, all of those kind of things. So I will link that in the show notes if you are keen to read the article and find out a little bit more about that. Uh, But, you know, our listeners in general are keen to keep up with the latest. So that was my hot take on uh, launching into Korea and what it would actually take to succeed here. Now, for our question of the week, I actually had someone reach out to me via Instagram DMs uh, asking about what to do for barrier repair. And the background was actually a little bit sad. He had had one of the aqua facials done over a year ago and suffered pretty extreme barrier damage. And he had tried pretty much every one of the top products that most people tend to recommend if you have a Uh, a damaged skin barrier and none of it was really working. None of the typical tricks that people usually suggest, pairing everything back, you know, taking it back to basics, babying your skin, all of that, it wasn't really working. So if this is you, and it definitely has been me before as well, that it just, I could not get it under control. A couple of last ditch things that you might wanna try. One that uh, can make a difference is if you are using chemical sunscreens, swap over to a mineral one. If the barrier really is compromised, then mineral sunscreens can tend to play a bit nicer than the chemical ones. But short of that, if you really have tried everything and none of it is working and you're still getting burning, stinging, all of those things after a year... At that point, I would honestly recommend going and speaking to a dermatologist if you can, particularly if it's something like this where you've actually been damaged as the result of a procedure. You know, from time to time, people get damaged from everything from microdermabrasion to microneedling, all of those things. You know, if something goes wrong or if they're, you know, in the wrong hands, they can be really damaging to the skin. At that point, I would actually go and speak to a dermatologist if you can. Uh, And the reason is that sometimes there are some medical options over the count, uh, sorry, um, topical creams and things like that, that they can uh, prescribe to you that you won't be able to get your hands on without a prescription. There are non-steroidal options as well as steroidal options. So you can discuss those with your dermatologist. But what I have found is that in cases of extreme barrier damage that you just cannot get under control with ordinary skincare, sometimes having that prescription reset is what you need to give your skin the breathing time to actually 
get it under control. And then all of those kind of things can be really helpful again, you know, avoiding actives, um, just focusing on hydration and all of that. But if it really has been a very long time and nothing is working, that is what I would suggest. Uh, Just to give your skin a break, Uh, constant barrier damage, constant irritation and whatnot. It, it, takes a lot out of the skin and it can be really hard to come back from sometimes that medical reset is what the skin actually needs so if you have been suffering for what seems like you know too long then that is something that i would suggest you know dermatologists are there for a reason there's a lot that you can achieve with at-home skincare but there's no need to suffer and there's no need to suffer for like years on end either so go and have a chat if you can to a professional and just find out what the options are it's your choice obviously whatever option you choose to proceed with but at least you can have that conversation and find out you know the various options and it could be that when you're there in front of them they recognize what it actually is and it might be more than just an impaired barrier it could be something like rosacea it could be lots of other different skin conditions that probably just won't resolve on their own so that would be my answer i know it's you know probably not the answer that a lot of people hope but sometimes you know it, there is a need for medical intervention uh, and that is the, probably the point at which i would suggest if after a year nothing is working and you've done everything you can have a chat and see and see if there's another option out there. Now, for our uh, most popular K-Beauty products in August, I thought I would do a little bit of a wrap up, a roundup for you, because I know a lot of people like to hear what's trending, hear what other people are buying. So I will introduce you to the five most popular products in August 2023 that were selling on stylestory.com.au. And they were in uh, chronological order, starting from number one, Subi Perfect Pimple Patch. That was the top selling product in August. The sales for that were up 72%. So a big increase there. Uh, at the number two spot was Dr. Jart's Sicker Pear Color Correcting Cream. So that's the tone correcting one. There was actually no change in the stats. So it wasn't up or down any. It was just staying steady for August. At the number three spot was Jellico's Bubble Tea Steam Cream. That was actually up 7%. Uh, so in August, so very, very popular product. That is pretty much always the number one best selling moisturizer on our site, but sales were actually slightly up for that last month. The number four best selling product was Subi's Bare Skin Balm, and sales for that were up 75%. So a big increase there as well. And rounding up the number five spot, Spot was Jelly Co's Chewy Glaze Toner. And this little one had a huge growth spurt that was up 133% in sales. So people that love that product really, really love it. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's getting more popular, which is great. I think it's been in the top 10 for a while, but it was in the top uh, five. So I, I think the reason that one is uh, popular is just because it is very, very versatile. The texture and formulation make it a pretty perfect fit for all skin types. Uh, it gets the unique texture from the birch, the combination of birch sap water, three types of hyaluronic acid. It is very, very unique. It's like a melting jelly texture. That's how I would describe it. So that little one was uh, the biggest grower out of the top five in August 2023. Now, let us take a look at some of the reviews for K-Beauty products that our customers have actually shared with us. So these are people that have purchased the products and tried them and left reviews on our site. And the first one was a five-star review for Skin 79's orange bb cream and our reviewer said beautiful product works extremely well on my oily skin it's a thick consistency but applies smooth and doesn't look cakey at all it's a perfect blend between foundation moisturizer and sunscreen so much better than trying to apply moisturizer sunscreen and foundation separately and dealing with stickiness product incompatibilities and pilling i am fair slash light neutral and i wear nars mont blanc this shade was a 
a perfect match for me. I don't even think I will use foundation anymore. I highly recommend. So that is such a useful review. Thank you very much. So anyone who is a NARS Mont Blanc, this is your BB cream match. Uh, that's Yeah, I love it when people say what shade they are in their foundation because that is the number one question we get asked when people are looking to swap over to a Korean BB cream. They want to know what shade that is going to be their perfect match. So that's so useful. Thank you very much. Our next review was for Subi's Hollow Dream Mask and Brush Set. And our reviewer said, I got this at the ECA, which is shorthand for the Brisbane Exhibition, if anyone is familiar not from from Queensland you might not know what that's about she says I was surprised by just how good it is not only is the packaging chef's kiss but the product actually works it's smooth skin and minimizes pores just like it said it would couldn't recommend more so thank you very much for that and the chef's kiss is actually in little kisses so that was very cute uh our next review it was a five-star review for Mary and May's vegan seeker toner and our our reviewer said, amazing. I just love using this toner after Innisfree's green tea foam wash. My skin feels smooth and refreshed. So thank you very much for that one. The, I think this is the last one. Yes, this is the last review I have for you. This is for Tosa Wong's SOS Red Spot Ovalison Cream. That is an absolute mouthful. I will have a link to this one in the show notes. Uh, basically, it's a uh, moisturizer type product in a tube. It's white with red on it in case you are trying to differentiate between the Tosa Wong ones because they have a lot that look the same, but the color is the only thing that's different. So this is the red one. Uh, and the reviewer said, very effective. I've been using this cream about a month now and it's great. It's super effective against surface level pimples and rashy, bumpy acne, calms everything down significantly and makes a huge difference overnight. Does not seem to do anything for deep blind pimples, but they are hard to treat. My skin also had a major freak out this month to a new product I tried out, which would usually take a good week or more to recover from. Using this cream, it was almost back to normal in a few days. We'll definitely keep a tube handy now very very interesting uh so thank you very much for that review and yeah ugh, blind pimples are the worst aren't they there's you can't use pimple patches on them there's so little that you can actually do um uh, <laughs> here's a little hack that i have uh discovered recently that actually worked on one of my husband's pimples last night if you do get something that looks like uh, inflamed and there is you know it's got it's got more than just the usual juice going on a tiny little bit of betadine like the antiseptic just to calm it down and then with a dab of calamine I have found really does help to bring down that redness uh, not for just your surface variety whiteheads but for something that's a little bit angrier and more aggressive that combination often works do not go overboard with it but just that can sometimes work to just bring the angriness and redness down a little bit and then you can you know treat it like a normal pimple the next day if it's come down a bit uh, he woke up this morning he's like wow it looks so much better and I'm like oh, honestly why why do you doubt me <laughs> he was so skeptical I was like trust me this is gonna work uh, <laughs> so if you do have one look that that has worked for me that has seen promising results on a few pimples that I personally have tested out my husband has confirmed it works uh, other people have tried that combination as well I was doing a little bit of ferreting around online to see if I was crazy. And I was like, no, no, no. Other people are talking about this too. So there must be something in it. Now, for my recommendation of the week for this week, I actually shared this on my Instagram stories and people thought it was hilarious. However, <laughs> there is a, a type of UV hat that is really popular here in Korea, particularly amongst older women. And I'm talking about women in like their 50s, 60s and above. Uh, and it's basically a really long hat that has multiple sides and it's all UV resistant so you can literally cover your whole face and the sides of your face it's excellent for people who take really long walks in the sun for people that do a lot of driving 
I always wear a hat when I'm driving, but sometimes you can't block out the sun coming through the side of the window. And if I'm on like a really long drive, which in Seoul, honestly, the traffic is so bad that even if it's not a long drive, it ends up being a long drive. I'm always in the car for like at least an hour, it feels like with the traffic here. I like to be protected from the sun. I don't want one side of my face just sitting in the sun for like an hour. That is when I use my UV hat. It's actually my driving hat and you can adjust it up and down uh, so that you can block out the sun where it needs to be. They're amazing. They are cheap, really, really cheap. Um, I'm not sure how easy they are to get outside Korea, but I'm sure you probably can. Uh, If you are keen to see this this bad boy, then come and find me on Instagram. I'm going to put up a video showing it. It looks ridiculous and a lot of people are like, oh my God. I would never wear that outside. And look, you know, if you are not that serious about your sun protection or, you know, looks trump everything, then this is probably not the type for you. But um, being that I am probably one of the whitest people alive, (laughs) I just prefer to wear it. Um, And I have no shame. I don't care if I look ridiculous. You know, I'm a white person in a country full of people that are a different race from me. I stand out everywhere I go anyway. So that does not bother me, you know, getting... And look, the good thing is here, nobody stares. (laughs) Nobody thinks it's strange people are probably like why is that you know foreigner wearing um you know the the old lady hat they probably think that but like no no one would bat an eyelid here sun protection you can go as crazy as you want with it here and people will not care at all in other countries your mileage may vary i'm pretty sure i saw like an article or a post on like the cut or the New Yorker or something like that. And it was like, you know, oh, how crazy is this hat? And I was like, what are you talking about? That's standard issue here in Asia. Like so many people have hats like that. What are you talking about? If you're really serious about your sun protection or you just want to wear this, you know, when driving, I can highly recommend it. It looks ridiculous. Like I admit that it does look ridiculous, but uh, looking ridiculous in me, we go way back. It's fine. (laughs) All right. I am going to leave it uh, here for today. I will be back in your ears next week with another deep dive episode for you. If you have enjoyed today's episode and you think that there is someone that would also enjoy it, I would absolutely love if you would share it with them. Uh, You know, pop a link in your favorite Facebook group, uh, wherever you hang out, that would be highly appreciated. If you haven't already, I would also love a rating and review just because that does actually help new people find us as well. All right, until then, I will see you on Style Story. 